much computers as you can. Every Egyptologist should have at least two strings to her or his bow if they're going to be able to eat and practice Egyptology. So don't limit yourselves, expand yourselves because Egyptology encompasses everything. You want to learn about the ancient Egyptians and so their world was like ours except without some of the fine technology. So the more you have at your command, the more chance you have of understanding them. So um, I went, I studied archeology span and history and anthropology. And then I went on to do my MPhil and my PhD. I did archeology span as well. That was my second string. So I did Egyptology, but I'm also a zoo archeologist. So if the Egyptology fails me, I can go and look at animal bones anywhere in the world and I will be able to pay for food and a roof over my head. Oh, you still got that to fall back on then, Salima. <laughs> Darling, if it all fails, I've got that. As I told my father when he said, what are you thinking? I said, I can wash dishes if nothing else works. That was before they had lots of dishwashers in every restaurant. <laughs> So I know that your work involves a lot of looking at animal mummies in particular. Now, what, what did that stick out for you as a particular area of interest? It happened totally by accident, Sarah. I was interested in ancient Egyptians, how they lived, what their daily life was. I didn't like kings, I didn't like religion. I wanted to know what people ate, what they drank, where they slept, where they went to the bathroom, how they washed their clothes, what medicines they took. So when I did my PhD, I actually worked on what people ate. So my dissertation was on meat production in ancient Egypt. And that was my focal point. Um, and then it extrapolated from there because I w one of the things that people do to preserve meat is make mummies. And one kind of animal mummy is a food mummy. So when I moved to Cairo as an adult with my husband, um, I went back to one of my favorite rooms in the Egyptian Museum, which is the animal mummy room. And it was shut and the windows were broken and it was a bit of a mess. And I thought, oh, this is so sad. I want everyone to see this room because it's magnificent. It teaches you about the ancient Egyptian environment, people's relationship to animals, and religion so you know like this cute dog you have there how, how about how, mummifying her not yet but <laughs> when the time comes i'm ready <laughs> i could post her to uh cairo for you <laughs> did you hear that orchid <laughs> Harry says hi as well oh, oh. You oh look another one <laughs> so um basically then i started i raised funds to work because this room was a mess and the director of the museum i had volunteered there when i was a student he said great if you can do it go ahead so i did so i got permission i raised thousands of dollars thanks to many generous people i reconserved all the animal mummies photographed them um, studied them and got new cases and installed them and then after that it sort of spun off because at that time in the mid nineties, no one cared about animal mummies very much. But I thought that animals were so important to understand the ancient Egyptian environment and also how people deal with the natural world, 
whether it's for food, whether it's for pets and companionship, whether they are gods. So that's how it all started, totally by accident. Wow. It's, um, I think it's amazing working with the daily life of ancient Egyptian people, because I think that's one of the things that I find most interesting. I'm much more interested in how people lived rather than uh, records of wars or the king lists and things like that. I think uh, food and drink probably is especially interesting for kids. So, Salima, how do ancient Egyptian people go to the toilet? Well, oh, my God. So, <laughs> the ancient Egyptians had the best toilet seats. Ah, brilliant. They were the first people to ever have toilet seats. But so I've seen two examples. Of course, if you're very poor, you just go out into the desert and you dig a hole and you poo. And if you're peeing, you just go out and pee. But otherwise, if you're a bit richer, they actually had wooden toilet seats which you sit down and then underneath you put a pot with some sand in it and you do your business and you wipe yourself off with either potsherd or bits of plant and water and then that sort of once it's a lot they put it throw it into a big hole somewhere and then later on it can be used as fertilizers and then they also have this amazing limestone toilet seats which you sit on but you have to have very good aim because the holes are a bit small and these were put on bricks sets of bricks so you can sit there and it's just like a loose seat right now and it's a fantastic like a sort of throne room type situation yeah and the egyptians weren't like the romans the romans all sat around together on their little seats pooping and and peeing yeah, and you know what's quite funny because the Romans would write letters when someone moved away. Oh, we missed you so much at the Pissoir this morning. We were sitting there and we were pooping and peeing and talking about such and such, and we thought you would add so much to the conversation. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. That's I like those little letters between people. That's really good. So um, we've got some kids here. One thing that I'm, we must remember to do is it's Aisha's birthday. Aisha, where are you? Salima, I said we'd wish Aisha a very happy birthday. With pleasure. Where is Aisha? Where is Aisha? Aisha? Uh, I'm Hello. Aisha. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Aisha. Where are you? Yes, thank you. Very good. And how old are you? Tomorrow I'm going to be nine. Oh, that is the best age. You're brilliant. Your brain works really well and you have a fabulous memory. <laughs> so Thank happy you. birthday. And I hope you enjoy your years of good memory and brilliance. It gets worse after Thank you. You're 21. <laughs> I should Thank you. Aisha, do you think you're going to get into learning about ancient Egyptian toilet habits? When you get older? Mm, yeah. <laughs> like to. Good. So, Aisha, what do you like best about the ancient Egyptians? Mm, I like their mummies and pyramids. I love the mummies myself. I think they're so cool. It's so amazing how the ancient Egyptians figured out how to make people look like themselves for 5,000 years. It's really fantastic. Don't you think it's yeah. clever? Yeah. Uh, can I have a question, please? Of course. Does Sudan have more pyramids than Egypt? It does, but they're much smaller. They're tiny. Good. They look, do you know Toblerone <laughs> chocolate? Sorry? Do you know Toblerone chocolate? It's a triangle-shaped chocolate. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's a try. So when I first went to Sudan, I was so amazed because there were so many pyramids, but they were all very, very steep and quite small. But it looked like someone had taken a bar of this triangular shaped chocolate and put it all over the landscape. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yes. I just kept thinking all the time I was working there, oh, I really want some chocolate. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome and happy birthday. Thank you.
Daisy Foster said that she made some ancient Egyptian cookies once. I don't know what shape they would have been. We made some ankh-shaped cookies the other day that were very good. Nice. Daisy, have you got um, ancient Egyptian cookie cutters or did you make a particular shape? Um, they weren't a particular shape. They were actual cookies that they would have made in the ancient Egyptian oh. times. Oh, what was the recipe? Um, well, I don't really know. It was for homework for an ancient Egyptian lesson I did once. So I'm not sure where they got the recipe. Ah. Okay, so did you make it with flour or did you make it with anything else? Do you remember how you made them? Um, it was ingredients that they would have had to use kind of different things back then. But we made it with like flour and uh, there was no sugar. It was icing sugar and things like that. Okay. Daisy, Ooh. what did they taste like? They were really good. They had it like cinnamon delicious. and nutmeg and things in them as well. Oh, nice. delicious. Um, I was reading about different types of ancient Egyptian bread and I think ancient Egyptian food is a really interesting subject for people. I know you recently did a talk for the Kemet Club that was all about um, food and beauty and hygiene in ancient Egypt as well. So what would the yeah. average ancient Egyptian person eat on a day-to-day -day person based upon their status? If you were a poor person, you ate a lot of bread, you ate some onions and you ate lentils and cucumbers and drank a lot of beer. If you were slightly higher up, as you became higher up, you got more and more meat in your diet. You know, there were no chickens, there were no tomatoes, there were no potatoes, no oranges or lemons in ancient Egypt because they came from either the New World or the Eastern part of the world. So um, Egyptians had lots of roast meat, they had lots of, um, Barbecue, in fact, they invented the best barbecue going, um, kebabs, kuftas, and um, lentil salads, and all kinds of things like that. And they also like their dessert with honey, pastries, and dates, and figs, and cakes made with these things. And sort of the first ever plum pudding. You all know Christmas pudding, right? Mm. They seem to have had made with raisins and figs and fat and things mixed together so that people could have this deliciousness. So people think the Christmas pudding is really English, but it probably was invented in ancient Egypt. Is that the cake that's like a cone shape? Because that's, what's that one like? Oh, that one's probably just, you know the word pyramid? Mm. The Greek, the, the word for pyramid comes from Greek, which is pyramis, which is the name of a triangle cake. Mm. So the Egyptian plum puddings were more like our plum puddings, which are big blobby round things. Oh, right. so there's and a bread isn't there that's like cone shaped that you that's see. It. Uh, so that's, part of something. that's it. That's much more pyramids. Mm. And you know, um, uh, the word for obelisk, that's a Greek word from obol, which is a, a unit of measurement, money, but it's also a long spike which you make kebabs on oh wow so all of these words that we have for pyramids and obelisks and so on are really food words but they're greek food words i think that that's one of the things that makes um understanding hieroglyphs and inscriptions on tombs quite difficult because so many of the words we learn in books are greek words and the Egyptian words are completely different. So when we try to translate the hieroglyphs, unless we know the Egyptian words for things, they don't make sense, especially the names of kings or people. They're sometimes very different. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Uh, Krista says, as a second year Egyptology student, I would like to ask about possibilities after I finish uni. I have one more year and I would like to know how hard it is to find a job in Egyptology. Also, what I need to do uh, Egyptology, archaeology, is it enough if I do my master's in archaeology? Sorry if it's too long. <laughs> no, it's a bloody good question. So if you want to be, there, there's a few things you can do if you get a degree. So if you want to be an Egyptologist, you can be, work in museums, you can teach in university, or you can get a degree in Egyptology and you can do something completely different by day 
and do something completely different by night. So, to be a proper Egyptologist, you will need a PhD. And then if you, you can go and work for, you know, the, the uh, Ministry of Defense or somewhere, the civil service, then you work by day and then at night you do Egyptology. Aidan Dodson, who's a really well-known Egyptologist, he worked for the Ministry of Defense through most of his life and then but he published in Egyptology in the evenings. So you can have a proper job and do Egyptology. I teach at a university and I work at a museum. So that's the other option. Either you work at a museum or you teach at university and then you do Egyptology. Otherwise, it's harder. You can do anything. When you train in Egyptology, your brain is primed to do anything because you can think you can write, you can present, you can be analytical, you can persuade people about all sorts of nonsense, um, but you might not get a job in this field because there are very few jobs. You can go and dig, but after you know 10 years of digging with not much money, it's tiring. And if you want to ever have a family, it's difficult. I mean, very brutal, yeah. So if you want to be an Egyptologist, you should get your master's and a PhD. Um, and then whether you get a job teaching or in a museum, yeah, who knows? There's also heritage management, but you could also then train in Egyptology, get a job in heritage management in England or France or anywhere. Those are your basic options. Right. Not always salubrious. <laughs> one thing I have to tell you, my father and my mother, but my father in particular said, you know, you won't get a job. I said, I know I won't get a job, but I love this more than I love anything else in the world. And because I'm from Pakistan, actually, I'm not Egyptian. So he said, you're not Egyptian. You're not American, not British. You're not French. You're not Italian and you're not German. They all have institutes in Egypt there is nothing for you. You would have to, and at that time, chaps, it mattered, I was a girl, I still am. But they said, it's harder. So he said, you have to be twice as good as everyone else. Oh, well, you've managed that. But it worked, <laughs> chaps. And now women dominate the field. And I think that we should do First, what is our heart's desire? And, but always have something practical you can do in case things go horribly wrong. But always go for what you really want. But you have to be sure that you have enough love and passion for it and that you're willing to scrub floors or dishes. Was there ever a point where you thought something was going terribly wrong and you wanted to maybe change? You know... I was so in love with the ancient Egyptians that I never had a moment of sensible thought, Curtis. <laughs> I, I mean, I was sitting there going, thinking, okay, but you know, when I moved to Egypt, I was writing for magazines, I was doing tours, I was doing lectures, I was doing anything to make ends meet. We had a small grant, my husband was living, you know, and I thought, well, if it goes, to hell in a handbasket, I'll do something else. But I love the ancient Egyptians so much that I didn't waver. And alhamdulillah, they gave back. So I have been, I have to say, I've been really lucky. I have worked a lot, but I have been blessed. Yes. <laughs> um, I've got some questions here from Mary and Jack. Mary would like to know if Egyptians used uh, sandstone and did they use iron? And Jack would like to know, when did they start to pull brains out of noses and why did they do it? Okay, Jack first. In mummification, the first real evidence, and we have to remember it's not across the board, but it's more in the New Kingdom that we have the removal of the brain, which is excerebration, through the nose where they break through your ethmoid bone, but also they would sometimes make a cut in the back of your neck down there 
and they would then remove your brain and stick out, probe up the hole there and take out your brains. So it's more of a new kingdom phenomenon, Jack, but you do have a few scattered examples from the Middle Kingdom. And they realized that what was going, you know, the brain was putrefying, so it's better to empty it out and put resin in there so your skull will be whole. So that's Jack's question. Now, iron. We have examples of meteoric iron in Egypt, not a whole bunch. So a meteor is a bit, it's basically iron from the sky that comes hurtling through space, burns brightly as it enters the Earth's atmosphere and then <laughs> lands in a lump. So at the site of Heliopolis, which is the sacred site for the creator god Atum and the sun god Re, we think there was probably a real meteorite. And that's why they chose this spot to be a place for a temple. We have never found it. But the hieroglyph sort of shows this pyramidal lump, which is why pyramids, one of the reasons why pyramids might take that shape. So we have from Tutankhamun's tomb examples of meteoric iron. And even in the uh, much earlier periods in Egyptian history, like about 3000 BC, we have some iron beads that were used in necklaces for people. In Tutankhamun's tomb, there's an amulet, teeny weeny, in the shape of a headrest, some blades from chisels, and the blade of a dagger, all made of meteoric iron. We don't know where it comes from. One person or some scholars have suggested maybe there was a meteorite that collapsed in the Western desert and these come from that. But so far, although some, t some tests have been done, we can't do enough tests because it's destructive. So we don't know. So that explains that. Mm -hmm. And sandstone was used frequently because from Jebel Sicilla onward, there's a lot of it and it's cheap and easy to cut. Um, you know, know. <laughs> or do we ask Zaha her question first? Uh, Zaha's just written her question. Where is it? Oh, oh yeah, Zaha, you've unmuted yourself. Do you want to ask your question? Um, how, do, how do you know um, when and where to dig for, to find a tomb? Zaha, may I say that I adore your backdrop? It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, oh. So in some places, you know, because there's so many tombs there, you kind of know there's a tomb there, like in Luxor. But in other places, we do surveys, which means you walk through areas or you look at Google Earth imagery. And if you see that there are depressions, little dips and holes, you will dig there. Um, sometimes you listen to people's stories from villages and they say, oh, there are tombs in those hills. Then you know that as well. But in most of the places of Egypt, because they're so well explored or stolen from, we know where there are tombs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians used bones for smelting. We do have bones sometimes of animals, particularly being used for fire, but I don't think that they burn well enough to get you high enough temperatures for smelting. Um, and mental health, Sam, uh, I don't really know. There's some theories about it. If you look at Egyptians nowadays, people say, but this is Islam. They say that you've been touched by God. So people who are not quite okay are sort of looked after. In ancient Egypt, it depends what it was. Everyone pulls out the classic text, the dialogue between the man and his bar about a man trying to say, the world is terrible, I'm gonna kill myself, it's horrible, blah, blah, blah. So um, there is not that much about the psychology of the ancient Egyptians, though it has been touched upon. William asked about Cleopatra's tomb. Do you think we're close to finding Cleopatra's tomb? What are your thoughts on that? If one thinks it's in Tapasiris Magna, no doubt it will be found. Uh, Aisha asked, how many pyramids are there in Egypt? 
at least 82 royal pyramids. But Aisha, you must remember, after in the New Kingdom, people started to make lots of pyramids out over their tombs. And I don't count those because then everyone had them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, Avram, I think it's lovely that you wrote those poems. Um, I don't know how easy it is to do Romanian to Arabic, I'm afraid. Um, there are not that many places in Romania, but there are other places in Eastern Europe where you can study Egyptology. Um, because, and, and you can obviously come to the American University in Cairo to study it. Um, but, and I wish you luck. And if you need any advice, you can find my email on the American University in Cairo website and I can give it to you there separately. Daisy Foster asked, uh, the, Rosetta, the Rosetta Stone was the original way we learned about what the hieroglyphs mean, but how do we know that the Rosetta Stone uh, is correct or that interpretation is correct? I think by now, since we can read most texts, we're, we're okay with that. How, um, for the, the kids here that might not know about the Rosetta Stone, how did we work out from the Rosetta Stone? So um, the Rosetta Stone, like the Canopus Decree, is a text. It's written on a large piece of stone um, in three different kinds of texts. One is Demotic, which is a form of Egyptian. One is Hieroglyphs, which is definitely a form of Egyptian. And one is Greek. And several people were trying to decipher Hieroglyphs. And the person who won the race was a man called Jean-François Champollion, who was French. And he knew... Coptic, which is a form of Egyptian Greek, Christian, early Christian Egyptian, um, and he knew Greek. And so he looked at these three texts and by using little clues in them and his knowledge from before, he managed to figure out the names of certain kings that were on these texts. And then once he did that, he used those letters to figure out, like you crack a code, of the rest of it. And so he came up with an understanding of the basic format for Egyptian hieroglyphs. And then a man, Englishman called Thomas Young was fast on his heel. And he also had some of the same ideas and took it further. And because of that, you can start reading these texts quite well, and they do make sense. Of course, we're always trying to tweak the grammar and we might never get it right because we are not ancient Egyptians. Zoe wanted to ask a question. Zoe, do you want to unmute yourself so you can ask your question? Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi, Zoe. Hi. I'm currently studying a master's in Egyptology and I have a, a, a bachelor's degree in archaeology. And I was wondering how you would go about doing, um, participating in excavations in Egypt. So, Zoe, where are you studying? I'm studying in uh, Birmingham in England. Okay, so um, they had an excavation, but um, what's it moved to Australia, but I think they still have contacts. So if you go to your supervisor, who's your supervisor, sweetie? Uh, currently no one at the moment. Um, <laughs> with COVID, it's getting, it's a bit difficult but it's either going to be uh, Michaela Luiselli or Leda Olivaria. Okay, well, they're, they're lovely. Um, Michaela could probably put you in touch with people. Once you're a bit more advanced, you'll figure out what you're interested in. And there are excavations that are coming out of, well, not right now, but soon, various other British universities and if you want, if you would have to pay to do this, yes. because this is um, the South Assasif Conservation Project. Okay. Headed, South Assasif Conservation Project, headed by Elena Pishikova. It's self-funded, so you fund yourself to go there, but ask to work with Marion, who is the best archeologist there, and uh, lovely, but everyone's lovely. If you want to do art history, Elena is brilliant. I mean, she's phenomenal. Uh, and that is 
a place where you can go and pay and work and learn a huge amount. Okay. Thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. You're welcome, my dear. Uh, Salima Sabrina asks, did uh, ancient Egyptian, did each ancient Egyptian person know about all the gods or did they pick one and follow them? Um, Sabrina, that is a very good question and I can't say I can give you a true answer. I think they knew about some of the gods, but they always picked their favorite one. They'd know the chief god, they'd know the city god, they'd know the main gods and then whoever they chose to be their favorite god or goddess. And um, in ancient Egypt, were different religions and different cults tolerated? Did, were lots of people following different religions at the same time? The ancient Egyptians were so successful because they were religiously tolerant. As long as you believed in gods, you were cool. If you sort of, the one problem they had is if you said, my God is better than everyone's God and you're all wrong, that was not cool. But otherwise, if you said, you know, this is my God, you can have your God, that's fine, whatever, let's get on with it. I think from what evidence we have, that worked. And in fact, this idea for a long time filtered through the Egyptian psyche, which is one of the reasons why Egypt could be so tolerant and so successful, because people from all walks of life or ethnicities or religions could live here together happily and be really successful. How does that compare to modern day Egypt? Well, I think it's a little bit less successful because there's a little less tolerance since 1952. But in the heart, most Egyptians tend to be quite tolerant human beings. Mm. Interesting. Uh, 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 Zoe says, um, where's Zoe? Zoe would like to ask you a question about doctors, medicine and healthcare in ancient Egypt. Zoe, do you want to um, unmute your microphone and ask um, Salima yourself? Come on, Zoe. Go ahead. Come on. Oh, now she's being shy. Aww. I think she wanted to know. Hello, about Zoe. What do you want to know, sweetie pie? What, what ask your doctors, father to ask us. What were doctors like? Did they have access to medicines to help treat people? Oh, you know, ancient Egyptian doctors were perhaps the most famous doctors in the world. And even the Greeks came to Alexandria later on in about the fourth century BC to study ancient Egyptian medicine. So because the ancient Egyptians did a lot of mummification they learned a bit about internal organs and so forth so they had a sense of what happened and even if they weren't the best doctors everyone else thought they were because the egyptians based their ideas more on experimental work and so they had more respect and did more and they they did a lot of work doing with herbal remedies so they took lots of plants and they mushed them up and sometimes they weren't very successful, but sometimes they were. So they mushed things up and they try things to see if they work. But they did it in small amounts and it's really nice because the medical texts of ancient Egypt say, so-and-so is sick. If they're sick, first ask them all these questions. Then try something. And they tried something small. And if it worked, great. And if it didn't work, Zoe, they would try something else a little bit more serious. And they did it gradually, so there was no chance that the person would get really badly sick from medicines, so they could try and monitor their health. So in fact, it was the closest you get to modern medical practice in how they've worked. Does that answer your question, sweetie? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're um, welcome. Mary wanted to know how ancient Egyptian people would start a fire. How did they make fire in ancient Egypt? There were two ways. One was using um, flints, the white ones, uh, or uh, the quartzy things. And the other was the more common one is you have a piece of wood and you make holes in it. And you have another piece of wood that fits in. And then you do this. And by the friction, and it takes a bit of skill, like, let me tell you I've tried. 
um, you get sparks and then you, you put, you put a little bit of, uh, vegetal material. So you do this and then suddenly it catches a flame and you go, ah! um, and then you try and get your piece of wood to light up and then you have your fire. Uh, Aisha asks if there are, there are any examples of books written in hieroglyphs. Yes, but the, you have to remember we don't have books, we have scrolls. Scrolls, papyrus scrolls. How do they make papyrus? Ah, well, you've seen papyrus plants, which are triangular in section, and they're very tall. So you take them, you take off the outer edge, and you slice them very thinly. You lay them out, and then you crisscross them. You put weights on them, and you massage them down and you sort of layer this and you wind up with this crisscross overlapping paper and because of the plants have this material sucrose viscose they blend together and then you take a stone a smooth stone you polish them up so that they become hard and strong and also smooth so you can write on them is there much papyrus left in yeah. egypt now well, papyrus have died out because people stopped using it in about the you know sixth century, seventh century AD, um, and by the eighth, ninth century they were using paper often made with mulberry. But then there was a lovely man named Dr. Ragab who reintroduced papyrus to Egypt in the twentieth century, and so now we have papyrus again growing along the banks of the Nile very much. Sometimes in some places it grows in the delta some, because it's gotten loose and goes, Wee we're home. Um, but in other places it's cultivated. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Gwyn has a question. Uh, medicine. Was medicine like Chinese thinking about humours? Not uh, exactly. No, no, no. They did and, have hot and cold, but they didn't have the same not we have not found a text that tells us that it was the same in that regimented way mm. and how did they uh, see the body, part? body parts mm. um i mean they obviously knew that each body part had a separate role to play and they isolated them and identified them and you even see that in the hieroglyphs their exact depth of knowledge for the full capacity of each body part is unclear to us Before horses came in, the ancient Egyptians used to walk, use boats, and use donkeys, and they could have wagons pulled by cattle. Uh, uh, Curtis, do you want to ask your jewellery-based question? So, Salima, we've all seen your amazing jewellery. I mean, we've always seen, like, the earrings, you know, all these things. Um, with regard to ancient Egyptian jewellery, what would you say is your favourite piece and why? That is so hard to say because, as you know, Curtis, I love jewellery. I adore jewellery. I want to adorn myself at all times. Um, so, ah, I can't choose one, but I love big pectorals with as long as there's gold involved, mm -hmm. a lot of gold and enamel work. Um, and I love some of these things from the Middle Kingdom. The crowns, you know, one of my favorite things is that delicate crown made of enamel flowers, not yeah. real enamel, but inlaid flowers with a bow at the back which is so beautiful and delicate and and gorgeous and there's one and with so, a gazelle on the top as well yes and and anything with the uraeus because i love snakes okay <laughs> so uh, i have to say it's very hard to choose one thing because i look at something and oh that's wonderful and then i see something else and go oh i want that too <laughs> so shopping is dangerous for you Oh, jewellery shop, my two weaknesses, books and jewellery. <laughs> Complete catastrophes. I was reading about uh, Tutankhamun's, I think it's the pectoral that has the winged scarab in the centre and the stone yeah. the scarab is um, maybe made from a tectite that's... Uh, oh my God, oh my God, you're talking about this wonderful piece of desert glass. I went to the site. 
So Tutankhamun was quite interesting because you think with a king, it's all going to be grand stuff, but it isn't. You know, there's a simple worn seashell with a gold surround. There's a piece of wood. There's something else. There's a tooth or something. Like. It goes from the most elaborate things to the most mundane. But this is fantastic. Way in the distance in the Western desert, a meteorite seemed to, or something, lightning hit the sand. It heated it up. There was an explosion. And we have extraordinary desert glass mainly green but some yellow someone went out there i don't know how they went out and came back safely there's no water there's nothing it's it's really a very rigorous taxing amazing expedition and they brought back some stone which was carved into a scarab that wow. was put in that pectoral that one which is so amazing is it this one yeah that one yeah, that's the one. That's the one. This one on the left. Oh my God, that's it. That's it, Curtis. The same thing <laughs> happened in Germany and created Moldavite, where a meteorite hits the earth. It creates such incredible temperatures that it actually turns the surface of the earth into plasma. And when the plasma cools, it forms this um, amazing desert glass. And in um, Germany, I think, where this meteorite landed, it hit a carbon deposit and it instantly turned all of this carbon into diamonds. So there's a, village, there's a village near Bavaria where all of the stone has been quarried from that area. And so it has tiny little diamonds in all of the walls. Cool. Rectite's very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. I'd love to know more about it. So by the way, Alexander the Great was buried in Alexandria, not in Siwa. Um, so let's see what else we've got here. Um, oh, Zoe, do you want to ask your question about cat mummies and cats in religion? Yes. Um, do you think, or do you believe that cats and their cat mummies were sort of the most beloved and favorite animal for the Egyptians in general? Or do you think they were more equal to other animals and we just think this because of how much has been studied? I think some of it's how much has been studied. But I have to say that cat mummies were popular. And if you read my book, Divine Creatures, there's a chapter in it about cat mummies. Mm -hmm. And I do think that the ancient Egyptians loved cats a lot. So it's not just that they were the whole system of mummification, but they did like them a lot genuinely okay thank you i like um ibis mummies the best and i like uh thoth and imhotep but i think they were the divinities that you would give ibis mummies to is that yes right? you would you would have loved my my delightful handsome herman which was <laughs> an ibis i i i excavated him he was in this wonderful egg-shaped jar mm -hmm. and i pulled him out and i was so surprised because all of his feathers were there, Sarah. Wow. He was white and black. And then they carefully, the Egyptians carefully in his beak, put all of the snails that he liked to eat. Oh, that's it was so adorable. Do you see, are there many sacred ibis uh, flying around in those areas now? No, the sacred ibis became extinct in the late 19th century. I didn't know the sacred ibis was extinct. Or not extinct, in but just in Egypt, yeah. Yes, and we were trying to get more of them introduced. There was a French group that was doing it, but then the revolution happened, so we don't have them. But I don't, I still can't figure out why they went extinct because in South Africa and Curtis, you know, like the Hardy Hars, everywhere. Yeah, I'll just bring one with. They're like dumpster, yeah. dumpster chickens exactly. in other places. And, and now, because we have the, maybe the cattle egrets were more successful and so the sacred ibis left because the cat leaguer said to you don't know <laughs> but it did, you don't think that the trade in somewhere like saqqara of, of no if we had them in the 19th century that means they could not have been extinct okay, yeah. by us yeah yeah Right. So I wanted to also say to Rob, there's a lot of ancient Egyptian poetry. You can look it up. Look at Miriam Licktime's translations. Uh, let's have a look at some of these. Stephanie asks, uh, how did Stephanie, that to children you know, with disability? 
from the mummies and bones we have studied, the ancient Egyptians were much better about disabled people than the Greeks were. The Greeks would throw their children onto dung hills and expose them to die, whereas the Egyptians did not. And we had people who had strokes, who might have had disabilities from birth, who were looked after. I have had a couple of fairly serious accidents and I have been in a wheelchair for a while and recently I have been on crutches again because I have issues with mobility. And I am, like you, very sensitive now to have... Oh, sorry, Salima. I've just accidentally muted you. <laughs> okay. Oh, so I'm, I, I'm very quite sensitive about how you access sites if you are a disabled person. But I think right now it's quite hard, but in ancient Egypt, people would be like, oh, you need to go somewhere here. We'll carry you. And in fact, when I was working on an excavation, I couldn't walk very well. The workman just said, sit on this chair. And then they picked it up and they took me to the top of the hill. And then when I had to go down a hole, they just put me in a sling and they lowered me down and I dug and then they pulled me back up. Didn't have to use my legs. <laughs> uh, let's have a look at any of the other questions we've got here. Uh, so so I just want to say to Gwen, oh, yeah. um, you're safe. It's still handicrafts. As and no, they did not get pull out cat brains. No cat's brains pulled out. Too small, not worth it. Uh, Zaha asked about um, who is the Pharaoh in the time of Moses? I don't do Moses. He's Bible. Mm -hmm. we, separate, we separate religion and religious history from history history because you never know God's timeline is different from ours. Uh, Aisha asked, who was ancient Egypt's biggest enemy? Depends when, Aisha. Because sometimes it was the north, sometimes it was the south, sometimes it was the west. It depends on the time of year. Um, the time of Tutankhamun? Um, that time of Tutankhamun, and Nubians were a bit trying to get in. And I think because his father had messed up so much, some of the people in the north and the Hittites were trying to move in. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Salima, did you write a whole book on meat processing in ancient Egypt? How does that manage to fill a, an entire <laughs> dissertation? It's brilliant. It's the most brilliant piece of work I ever did. Did they, did they have ham? They wouldn't have had ham, I suppose, but was there oh, an equivalent? Did. Oh, they did. They did. People think the ancient Egyptians didn't eat pigs, but they did. Ah, so um, <coughs> poorer did people they... ate pigs, richer people ate cow. Have you ever had biltong? Of course, my dear. <laughs> During my dissertation, I was learning how to make biltong, and I contacted this man <coughs> who was South African, who had started to make biltong, and he was selling it at Harrods. And so I called him up and he wouldn't tell me the recipe because first he thought, who's this mad woman? <laughs> and then he realized I was a mad Egyptologist. So he said, I can't tell you the exact recipe, but he told me the process. <laughs> and then I made it in my flat as experimental things and I fed it to my friends. What did they I think? Excuse me. Bless you. Oh, some of them liked it, some of them hated it, and some of them asked for more wine. <laughs> uh, Sabrina asked some good questions about um, makeup and what kinds of makeup ancient Egyptian people might have worn. And where, did they use toxic or poisonous substances at all? No, unlike the English who often use lead, the Egyptians used ochre, which they would grind up. It's a naturally occurring mineral, which is not toxic. And you mix it with oil or with um, fats. And that gives you a rouge and the different intensity gives you a lipstick. They ground up uh, galena for coal and malachite for greeny eyeshadow. Oh, malachite eyeshadow. That sounds amazing. I want some of that. It's beautiful. It's a bit yeah. hard to grind, but it's lovely. Mm. 
Um, and what about their hairstyles? How did they make that? I was talking about wigs yesterday. I thought Malachite was actually bad. And for a period of time, um, they, they moved it. They didn't put it near the eye because they'd realized it wasn't good. I seem to have missed that time period. Oops. Okay. Um, they wouldn't use the copper thingy. They sometimes were using a mixture of copper. That's what they stopped using. And copper um, and malachite um, develop together, don't they? So maybe that's why. Yeah, they do, yeah. exactly, exactly. My, my, my bad. I did know though that they got smart and stopped once they saw the effect. I was asking with relation to how their medicine developed. I don't know when, I mean, the malachite kept being used throughout, even into the Greek time, I think. We don't have enough evidence to really pin it down. I would love to know, but I don't. That's how Nefertiti lost her eye. Oh, Curtis, stop it. <laughs> oh, I so think much. Curtis is laughing at me. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Uh, Salima, what are your thoughts on the head cones of ancient Egypt, the wax domes that people had? Oh, on? I think what's, okay, I've always believed in them. Some people said, oh, this is the idea of perfume, yeah. and this is not real. And then in Telenamana, they found a mummy with a head cone. So yes, they're real. The ancient <laughs> And I think they probably had like citronella, so they kept away the bugs. Mm. But I also wonder about the relationship to bees because they had a, a great deal of respect for bees and the products of bees and the the cones have been discovered to be out of beeswax, haven't they? Fat. Fat. Oh, it's, I thought I said beeswax in the Amana. I, mean. I think there was some beeswax mixed in with fat because beeswax is more expensive. Yeah, and they were like uh, poor people in Amarna, weren't they, in the graves? They were. Yep, they were. So do you think they could have been like copies of fancy head cones and not as could good be. as like a rich person's head cone? Could be. Uh, Sabrina says, did they only use makeup for being pretty or were there, were there some other rituals absolutely they use them for ritual purposes as well so it's not just to be pretty but you would also put them on in a ritual way to transform yourself because even now when you put makeup on you are affecting the transformation and if you are doing it as part of a temple ritual you are transforming yourself into another being so you are taking power and if you say the right spells the right prayers you are getting even more power with each anointment. So may my eyes look as big as Hathor's. May my skin be as fresh as so-and-so. So this is part of your transformation. So even now, when you use makeup, not in a religious way, you're still transforming yourself. Mm. And it's still a metamorphosis associated with a ritual magic practice. Did that same idea apply to their wigs as well? Did certain wigs reflect certain goddesses or gods and, and fashion? Absolutely. That's why they had short hair, because then you could just flop your wig around and you could have your party wig, I'm a half ball wig. Oh, I'm serious today. I'm going to wear the, you know, soft female version wig or sesh out wig. And so everything could evolve and change. And they had knits as well. Oh my God, yes, the wigs and their hair have nits in them. That's why they, they had those special fine combs that they used to comb their hair out. Have you got any ancient Egyptian knit combs? Um, I have knit combs and hopefully I don't have any nits. <laughs> uh, let's have a look here. What other questions have we got here? Uh, Sarcophagi are... were made of all kinds of stone, but limestone. Sandstone, sometimes quartzite and granite were the favorites. Oh yeah, Sam asks about returning to ancient Egyptian practices, yeah, the rise of sort of cometicism and uh, modern day ancient Egyptian religion. What, do you, what are your thoughts on, on that kind of thing? That's lovely. Most people come from California who do that. Yeah, the Temple of Ra is based in California. Um, no, I'm just saying um, 
some people on YouTube, they've, you know, been very open about the fact that they've decided to join, you know, Kemetism and other ancient practices and been quite open about it. I just thought it was quite interesting that, you know, it's been a resurging interest now. I was wondering, you know, what, like, an Egyptologist, like, what your thoughts on it were. Well, I mean, um, uh, I can't answer for all Egyptologists. Uh, Pardon? I was just asking out of interest. That's, that's yeah, no, 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 fine. Uh, I think that, you know, people who have their religious beliefs should be allowed to exercise them. Sam, if you're really interested in Kemeticism, we did interview Paul Harrison, who uh, has studied Kemeticism and like modern applications of ancient Egyptian religious ideas. And we interviewed oh, okay. him at the Doris Club and that was quite interesting. And he spoke to a lot of people um, for his book, Profane Egyptologists, about Kemeticism and the revival of ancient Egyptian religion. So he's a good source for that sort of information. Um, Paul Harrison. Sorry? Paul Harrison, was it? Dr. Paul Harrison, yeah. Um, um, Mary asked, uh, what other animals did they mummify? Did they mummify everything? Sorry, so what? <laughs> uh, Mary asked, what animals were mummified? What other animals were mummified? We got everything was mummified except for hippopotami and donkeys. Was there except like... Early donkeys were buried if they were pets, but hippopotami were never mummified because they were associated with Seth, and Seth did not have an animal mummy cult. Were the animals related to Seth? Because I think the turtles related to Seth as well. No. Yeah, well, well, they didn't mummified. really bother with mummification of turtles. No, you don't really need to bother about mummifying a turtle. They've got that hard shell and everything. But were there um, certain animals that it was taboo to eat their flesh? No. The, uh, it, there might be certain animals that were taboo for priests to eat their flesh in certain months, but otherwise, as a blanket taboo, no. So you could eat a hippopotamus's flesh? Oh, they did often. Ah, oh, okay. And did that relate to worshipping the hippo goddess? No. You were just going to do the eat the hippo as because it was marauding and you were going to be hunting. <laughs> um, was there uh, uh, that you talked about preserving food for the deceased once someone died? You had like packages of food that were mummified for yeah. the priest. How did the um, supplies for the deceased person work in the context of a tomb? So what you would do is before you were buried or when you were being buried, there would be all sorts of food um, remains. And in the New Kingdom, they were salted, covered with oils and resins wrapped up and put in coffins for you if you were rich. Um, before that, they would just put them into a tomb and then they would sort of disintegrate, but the bones would remain. So you always had food for the afterlife. So it was on the tomb walls as pictures and it was also in real form so you could eat it. What kind of uh, grub did Tutankhamun have uh, mummified for him in his tomb? Uh, pardon? What kind of grub, what kind of food did oh, Tutankhamun have? Tutankhamun, being a growing teenage boy, had so much root. So he had geese, ducks, pigeon, and veal. Lots of it. Lots of it. Wow. And Zaha, I did not get your flat Stanley. <gasps> I'm sorry. I didn't get your flat Stanley. The mail is really bad here, so I don't always get things. It might come in, I don't know how many months. Oh, Aisha asked an interesting question about Egyptian beer, and it reminded me that I wanted to ask you about, um, I think a, a Nubian beer recipe has recently been found to be like antibiotic or something, but uh, they drank beer instead of wa like water often. They drank a lot yeah. of beer, right? The beer, about three to 4% alcohol was the most common drink for the ancient Egyptians. Um, everyone was paid in it. You've got lots of beer jars. They'd pop it open. They'd slug it down. Um, it was safest all year round. Sometimes, some certain times of year, Nile water was filled with too many microbes, so it wasn't good to drink. So beer was always a safer thing to drink. And would they drink it through straws? I'm sure I seen... Not always. Ah, okay. What they often do is they just drink it and they just use their teeth. Or you take the beer jar and you'd use a strainer, like Tutankhamun's tomb, we have a couple, 
and you pour it through the strainer and then you can glug, 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 glug. So is it true that ancient Egyptians' uh, teeth would wear down because there was so much grit and sand in their oh, food and in bread. their drink? In their bread, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and it wasn't just funerary bread, it was day-to-day bread. I, I have this experience now. <laughs> uh, William, yeah. are, are you working on a specific dig site? Well, right now, because of the corona issue, it's a bit dicey. I'm about to go down in a week to work with my friend Elena Pishikova, whom I mentioned earlier, who has found a new tomb. And um, I'm working on that and on a mummification deposit with her. Um, and I'm also working on a project in the Egyptian Museum. So, yeah, I'm working on a couple of things. Oh, that reminds me to ask you um, about the Grand Egyptian Museum opening. And do you have any involvement there? Or uh, what's 20, the story? 21, yeah. 2021 or 2022 early. I don't know. And uh, do you work at the Cairo Museum? Is, so, is some of the Cairo yeah. Museum um, objects being moved into the gem? A lot. Yeah. And, and some have been moved to Sharm el Sheikh, and some have been moved to Hargada, and some have been moved to Kafr el Sheikh. And have you had a look around at the Grand Egyptian Museum yet? Can you give us a, a little insight into what it looks like? It's very big. <laughs> it's got some stuff in it. It's very big. It, it does look very um, uh, big, enormous. It's the biggest museum in the world and the most expensive museum in the world. How do you think it's going to affect tourism to Egypt and like the world's love of ancient Egypt? I I'm thought, sure that people I will thought come. the unveiling was being compared to the British World's Fair when they built the giant glass, you know, stadium, indoor stadium, and when the Louvre and when the Eiffel Tower. I think from a culture perspective, that will become a symbol, a very strong symbol. I'm excited about it. <laughs> I think that answers the question. <laughs> um, uh, Aaron said, you mentioned mummification as a method of food preservation. Was this purely for use in funerary contexts or a method of actual food preservation as well? What actually happens is that a lot of the salting is something you would use for food in general. Mm. Did they apply the same principles of preserving food to human bodies? Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Laura says, when did horses arrive in Egypt? Were their horses buried with mummies and were they ever mummified? Horses came late to Egypt. They came probably with the Hyksos or thereafter. So second intermediate period, early New Kingdom. One of the earliest horse burials we have is that of Senenmuth's pet mare. Um, early 18th dynasty. There was supposed to be a horse at Buhen of the Middle Kingdom, but that's a debated date. So um, we don't have many horse mummies because they were not in the canon. If they were pets, then they might have been mummified. Now, Curtis asked, if you could eat one thing from the ancient Egyptian world, what would it be? Hmm. It would have to be something really delicious, Curtis. I don't know. Uh, some sort of steak, I suppose. I don't oh. think their food was gourmet. <laughs> uh, Zoe asks, do you think there are still large animal um, necropolises yet to be found? Absolutely, there are. What's your favourite animal that's mummified, Salima? That's really hard. I have two. Shrews and crocodiles. Oh, I forgot about shrews. Shrews, <laughs> it's adorable that they mummified shrews. I can't get over that. They're so cute. I actually think that maybe um, Set is based on a shrew hybrid because he's quite shrew-like in, in a strange yeah. way. His personality certainly is. <laughs> shrews are so tiny. How did they mummify shrews? Um, very carefully. Mm. And not much evisceration, but a lot of desiccation. And there's some, I've got a beautiful shrew from Abu Rawash. They, they mummified it, wrapped it up in linen, and then they used, they took thin, teeny weeny strips of papyrus, rolled it up, and then they rolled it around it. And the shrew, the tail is individually wrapped. It's gorgeous. 
Who would you um, dedicate a shrew to? You would Atum or Ra. Wow. So creator gods and the shrew is supposed to be omniscient at night. They can see in the day and the night. Oh, okay. and they're very, very perspicacious. Wow. I was talking to Ramadan, who you worked on for Kingdom yeah. of the Mummies on, on National Geographic, and he was telling me about those water bugs. Can you tell our audience about the water bugs that were discovered there? They're terrifying. Well, I was identifying them for Ramadan. It was really cool because suddenly you're going through this and these beautifully preserved bugs that have been deliberately placed, part of a magic ritual for sure, in the amongst the mummification material. So we still haven't quite found whether they're associated with Neith or what's going on with that, but they are very important. So and shrews are not horrid. They are not aggressive, and <laughs> they can't be cannibalistic. I don't care. So they're strong and powerful, and so they should be mummified. Because I mean, you know, what are you saying that a lion is charming? That those water bugs. Is, am I right in thinking they're about this big, or are they? You're completely enough? wrong. Oh, how big the are they? Size of my finger. I was thinking that they were massive because in that picture on the wall. No, 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 it's really the size body. of my finger. Oh, I am relieved because they looked really terrifying. No, that would be that would be questionable. No. So Ramadan was um, showing like a drawing on a wall in one of the tombs. That I th it might have just been on Ostracon. I can't remember now, but it's a, an illustration of a man spearing one of these bugs. And uh, it made some people think that perhaps this was like a mythological creature and then those bugs were discovered. Weenie weenie. Oh, good. Okay. Well, that is a relief for my and next And we don't have any mummified hedgehogs. Oh, mummified hedgehogs. There aren't any. That's Because you have the little desert hedgehogs there, don't you? But, but hedgehogs, how were they considered in ancient Egypt? They were cute. Um, you see them <laughs> Eaten, yeah, and they're Food. in the prows of ships, but otherwise no. And oh. there's some sort of deities associated with them, but they never made it into the big time. They also were food. Yes, they were food. I said that. <laughs> Delicious hedgehog stew. Um, no, no, you, you just bake them. You bake them with their, and then the, then you break them, and the flesh, the the pointy Spine. bits fall off. Yeah, and then you eat the flesh, soft flesh. Like a kind of sea urchin. Did they have any mummified snakes? Yes, I've got a most beautiful cobra. And like the full thing hood in and everything. Mouth. Yeah, thing in its mouth. Yeah, so it won't bite anyone. Oh wow! Um, now the person Laura Spittel. If you can get me some dead shrews, I'd be really grateful. I need some <laughs> comparative skeletons. I think shrew mummies are my new favourite thing. They're adorable. They're yeah. so cute. So cute. Uh, do you ever make uh, ancient Egyptian recipes yourself, Salima, at home, knocking I about? I do. They're what not you... always successful, but I do. What's your... I don't know if it's me or them. <laughs> What's your favourite recipe? I made a Mesopotamian stew once for um, Irving Finkel, which was had leeks in it, which didn't seem very Egyptian to me, but apparently leeks were a, a thing. Leeks are very Egyptian. Oh, wow. So I taught a class on food and my students and I made a whole ancient Egyptian banquet. Oh, delicious. It was really good. We, we tried, we had some, you know, in one of the ovens, one of the pots exploded because it was not well enough fired. And so there was a complete catastrophe. It was a, you know, wood burning oven. Um, so it's tricky. But it's doable and it can be delicious. Oh, also, I wanted to ask you about perfumes in ancient Egypt because I'm very interested in perfumes in ancient Egypt. And I know recently there was a, um, a discovery of some perfumes that may have belonged to Cleopatra, I think. What kinds of smells do ancient Egyptian people like? Um, myrrh, frankincense, lotus, rose, that sort of thing. Mm. Do you have any ancient Egyptian perfumes yourself? No. Oh. I mean, I've had, I've had essence of lotus and stuff like that, but yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Apricots were imported by the New Kingdom from the Near East. 
Oh, Isabel asks, did animal mummies have any of the protective amulets? Some did and some didn't. The ones who were um, gods, yes. Um, but otherwise not. I will try and post some recipes on my Facebook page, but I, right now I have a lot of students I have to deal with, so it might take a while for me to do that. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Laura's telling us about um, a friend of hers fried a shrew in her electric water pump last week, and uh, we trap them regularly, but they eat the mice. I thought shrews were, shrews are very tiny in England. They're Not very them. carnivorous and strong, <laughs> as Laura would uh, say. Zoe, do you want to ask your question about animal mummy preservation? Yeah. Zoe. Um, if, you, if there were to be found a big necropolis with thousands of animal mummies, what would, where would they all be put? Would there be enough room in the museums? So you're asking a very good question and one that I cannot tactfully answer. But yes, of course we have space for them. Okay, because I know in like the earliest 20th century they would turn them into fertilizer and so many... Oh God, no, 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 no. no. Um, and in fact, there's a big tour of mummies. Oh, there's the Sharm el Sheikh mummy. The Sharm el Sheikh Museum has a bunch of mummies from Sakara. And there's going to be a touring exhibition that is going to have lots of animal mummies in it too. So there is space. They are not being thrown away. <laughs> Good. Seven point eight million dogs that Paul Nicholson and I have been working on are safe and sound in Tsukar. Good. I wondered if perhaps they'd maybe rebury them if they got too many or we didn't rebury them, we just didn't take them out of their tombs. Right, okay. Interesting. Okay, and then I suppose you'd sort of keep that information hidden so people then didn't go and dig them up for themselves? We could try. Yes. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Salima. That was wonderful. And uh, thanks so much to all the kids, especially for coming along today and all the grown up guests. And I hope we got most of your questions answered. Um, Salima, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy your evening. I know it's a bit later in Egypt there. It's uh, quarter past seven in England. So oh, God, early. Well, thank <laughs> you so much, all of you. And thank you, Sarah, for organizing this. Thank, this you. thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Oh, I love the picture. Thank you so much, Zoe. That's really nice. Thank you all for coming. That was lovely. And thank you, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.